Good morning. It's going to be a great day. Praise the Lord. Well, not only are we having chapel here today, but Kenneth Copeland Bible College is joining us uh, live stream. So let's everybody wave and say hi to KCBC. Praise the Lord. I was blessed to be able to minister there just a couple of weeks ago, and I tell you, they're a hungry group of folks. It was, it was really wonderful. I tell you, people that come to Bible college, I often tell people, if you can't minister to Bible college students, you just can't minister. <laughs> I remember when we first started our Bible college, uh, Wendell Parr had been ministering for 28 years as a pastor, and the first time he got up, he just says, this is wonderful. He says, I've been pastoring and people fall asleep and sometimes don't come. And he says, now, if you don't come and if you don't listen, I'll flunk you. <laughs> he says, I've got power. And boy, Wendell just loved it. So uh, anyway, it's been good. All right, what I'm gonna do this morning is share with you about um, your conscience. And I've got a book entitled, Who Told You That You Were Naked? And we have people call in all the time and say, I want that book, and a book on how to be naked. <laughs> and that's really not what this is about at all. I'm sure most of you already got that figured out. All right. But let me turn over here to Genesis. And in Genesis chapter 3, this is where Adam and Eve transgressed against God. Let me go back to Genesis chapter 2. And in verse 17, the Lord told Ab uh, Adam, he said, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And did you know the words surely die are translated from one Hebrew word and it basically just repeats it. So what it says, you shall die, die. And there's two ways to interpret that. One of them is you will surely die. In other words, it is established because it was repeated. And some people interpret this, that you die spiritually the moment that you sin. And then eventually that leads to physical death. So the Lord had promised them that they would surely die. In chapter three, the serpent shows up and starts uh, countering the word of God. And I tell you, this is so important. This is those of you that are in Bible school, man, this is one of the most important things you can do to guard against the deception that is happening today is to know the truth. Over in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it says that because they did not have a love of the truth, God would send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And it says in 1 Timothy chapter 4 that in the latter days, people will depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. And man, we are in that day. People can't even figure out which restroom to go into. And I mean, you got, you got to be pretty dumb not to be able to figure out if you're a male or a female and stuff. It's terrible. And the answer is the word of God. And so Satan had to attack the word of God before he could get Adam and Eve into sin. If, if people, if all they did was embrace and stand on the word of God, they would never enter into sin. You have to depart from the word. You have to depart from the truth before Satan can get uh, at you. Uh, Jesus said in John chapter eight, verse 44, that Satan is the father of all lies. And so he has to give you a lie and you have to believe and accept that lie before you can get into sin. So he tempted Adam and Eve to sin and it says down here in verse 7 that as soon as they did eat, in verse 7 it says, the, this is Genesis 3, 7, and the eyes of them both were opened and they knew they were naked. That is amazing. I could spend all day on this. Most people haven't thought of this. But did you know that they were naked before they ate of the tree? It says up here in the second chapter, verse 25, they were both naked the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. So they were, they were both butt naked, amen? Some people teach that they had a robe of righteousness and they were covered in the righteousness of God. And I understand the point. And for symbolism and analogy, you can say that, that's accurate. 
But the scripture says they were both naked. They weren't one ounce more naked after they ate of the tree. It's not that their righteousness left. It says that their eyes were opened and they knew they were naked. Did you know they had been naked the entire time, but they didn't know it. You can preach an entire message on that, that they were so God conscious. You know, I'm not going to go into all of this. I don't think. But I believe men were created with more than five senses. What you can see, taste, hear, smell, and feel. I believe we were created with six senses and that sixth sense was faith. And by faith, you can walk by faith. Matter of fact, in the new covenant, Paul said in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, that we walk by faith and not by sight. And so under the new covenant, we aren't supposed to be controlled and dominated by our five senses. We're supposed to walk by faith. I believe that Adam and Eve were walking by faith so much that they hadn't even paid attention to the fact that they were naked. Now they weren't going around with their eyes closed. When it says their eyes were open, that didn't mean that prior to that time their eyes were closed, but they were walking by faith. They were seeing by their heart. And man, again, I could spend all day on this because I've gotten to where I can see things by my heart that I can't see with my eyes. And this is how you really walk in victory is where you get to where you are more controlled by what you believe on the inside, what you see with your heart than you are by what you see with your eyes. I believe Adam and Eve lived that way so much so that they had never noticed they were naked until they ate of the tree. And when they ate of the tree, all of a sudden their, their spiritual eyes closed and their physical eyes opened. And all of a sudden they looked and said, we're naked. Can you imagine being so God conscious that you don't even know if you got clothes on? Even if somehow or another you get so spiritual that you could do that, have mercy on the rest of us that are carnal, amen, and put your clothes on, praise God. But anyway, it says here that they noticed that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron and they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the trees of the garden and the Lord called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And look at this in verse 11. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree whereof I commanded thee that thou shouldest not eat? Boy, this is really powerful. The Lord said, who told you that you were naked? Apparently God didn't tell him or he wouldn't have been asking this question. And it doesn't say that the devil told him. You know how, you know how he knew he was naked? His own conscience told him. And let me just say something that I, I'm not exactly sure exactly how this happened. Either God created Adam and Eve without a conscience and when they ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is descriptive of what your conscience does, either when they ate of the tree is when they got a conscience or maybe God had created them with the conscience but it wasn't functional until they ate of the tree and that's when uh, the conscience began to work. But it was their own conscience that condemned them. It wasn't God that condemned them. It wasn't even the devil that condemned them. It was their own conscience that condemned them. And let me just say that all the way down here, approximately 6,000 something years later, our, one of our biggest enemies that we deal with is our conscience. There's a lot of people that will accept and say that I know that God loves me and that Jesus died for my sins. And they may accept it to a point that they believe when they die, they're going to go to heaven. Uh, but when they enter into the presence of God, they just enter in with a sin consciousness. Man, there are a lot of scriptures. I got that en entire book on this, but let me read a radical passage of scripture to you out of Hebrews chapter 10. And in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, it says, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of those things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? And there's a question mark there. This is a question. 
If the Old Testament sacrifices could have worked, then they had to quit offering sacrifices. The very fact that they had to repeat sacrifices over and over. There was a morning and an evening sacrifice. There was a sacrifice every time you sinned. There was a sacrifice every time you had a child. There was a sacrifice every new moon. There was a sacrifice all of the feast days. And then there was the day of atonement where you offered a sacrifice for the sins of the whole nation that had been missed. There was a constant flowing of blood. And this says that if the Old Testament sacrifices could have really worked, they'd have quit offering them. The very fact that they repeated them over and over showed you that they didn't really work. They were only symbolic. That's the reason we don't offer sacrifices today is because the sacrifice of Jesus did work. Amen. And he put an end to sacrifices through his one offering forever. So again, in Hebrews chapter 10, verse two, for then would they not have ceased to be offered? The answer is yes. And then it goes on to say, because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sin. You know, I'm not gonna have time today to explain the difference between a conscience of sin and consciousness of sin. This isn't saying that you just become oblivious and you don't realize what sin is, but you no longer have any condemnation, any conviction associated over your sin because Jesus paid for this. And this is saying that you should have no more conscience of sin. Most Christians don't even think that that's a positive thing. The average Christian thinks that being sin conscious where you come in and oh God, we're so unworthy and we come before you so humbly and God, we don't deserve anything and, and you just describe how ungodly you are. Most Christians think that's a proper way of approaching God. And yet that's not what the scripture says. Matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter four, verse 16, let us come boldly before the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and, and grace to help when? In the time of need. Not when you've done everything right, but when you've messed up, you should still come boldly before the throne of God. Man, there's so many scriptures on this. I'm talking as fast as I can. Hebrews chapter 10, look at this in verse 19. Having therefore boldness, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. You know, we just pass over that. Most of us do not fully understand what Jesus has done because we don't fully understand how bad things were before Jesus came. But before Jesus came, you know, there was the tabernacle and there was this large outer court. Now I'm, I'm talking about the tabernacle, not the temple, but the tabernacle had curtains that went around this large enclosure and people could enter in, anybody could enter into that out, outer uh, area that was... Uh, curtained off and there was a brazen altar there and you, that's where you offered your sacrifices for sin. And then even after the brazen offer, the priest would have to go through a cleansing with the lavers and they would have to clean themselves. And the priest could enter into this smaller tent that had two parts to it. One part was called the holy place and the other one was the holy of holies. And the priest had to first offer that sacrifice at the brazen altar, go through the laver and cleanse themselves. Then they had to go into the holy place and the priest, only the priest could go into that holy place, but nobody could go into the holy of holies except the high priest once a year. And Josephus, an early uh, first century Jew who wrote a history of the Jews for the Romans, he wrote, this isn't in the Bible, but he wrote that they would actually tie a rope around the high priest's leg and let it trail out into the holy place because if he entered into the holy of holies, even on that one day, there was only one day, the day of atonement that you could go in and he had to go through special cleansing, had to put on special garments, had to bathe his whole body, had to offer a sacrifice. There was all kinds of things he went through and if he didn't do it perfectly, over the Ark of the Covenant were these cherubs and cherubs aren't fat babies with wings and a harp. They are warrior angels. They were set at the east end of the Garden of Eden when God kicked Adam and Eve out to protect the way of the tree of life and they had a flaming sword. So these cherubims were over the mercy seat and if the priest, the high priest, even though it was only once a year he went in, if he didn't do it perfectly, those cherubs would strike him dead and they couldn't go in and get him so they kept this rope around his ankle so they could drag the corpse out and bury it. That's pretty serious. 
And yet this right here is saying that now, brethren, we have boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. And you know what separated the holy place from the holy of holies was this veil. And uh, in Solomon's temple, he expanded all of this and it was 60 feet high and 60 feet wide. And it was a veil that was so thick that Josephus, again, that Jewish historian wrote that it was gold thread woven all throughout this blue curtain. And he said that you could take a team of horses and tie it up to both sides of that veil and they could not tear that veil in two. It was so strong. And, the, and in Matthew chapter 27, when Jesus died, the veil of the temple was rent in two from the top to the bottom. Again, nobody could tear this veil but if they had been able to tear it, they certainly could have gone 60 feet in the air and have torn this thing from the top to the bottom. This was an indication that it was God that broke that veil. And the symbolism is, it goes on to say right here in Hebrews chapter 10, having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil that is to say his flesh. This veil symbolized Jesus. And until Jesus' body was broken, you couldn't have direct access to God. But now we have boldness to enter into the very presence of God through what Jesus did. And I'm not saying this to be critical of anybody, but there are very, very, very few Christians that enter into his presence with boldness. They enter in with a sin consciousness and this consciousness of their sin and their unworthiness makes them enter in bowing and scraping, apologizing. You know, we've got KCBC watching in today and I remember back, man, 40 something years ago, I heard Kenneth Copeland say this, that if you feel like a gnat on the back of an elephant when you come before God, instead of talking about how small you are, Talk about how awesome God is to love somebody as insignificant as you. But most of us, see, just come in and we go to talking about, oh God, we're so weak, we're so frail, which I'm not denying all of those things. It's hard to really understand this. When you think about God, the one who created the heavens and the earth and the heavens fit in the width of his hand is what the scripture says. And you go to thinking about his glory and everything that he is, and then you look at yourself. It's hard not to be uh, feeling like, man, you are insignificant. But Jesus has purchased a way that we can enter now boldly into the very presence of God. Man, there's so many things here I'd love to say. Look in the ninth chapter of the book of Hebrews. And in the first few verses, it lists all of the elements of this tabernacle and it makes applications. Uh, and like I said, the brazen altar symbolized where you receive salvation. And then even after salvation, you have levers that cleanse you from any defilement that you have. And then only the priest could go into the holy place and there was showbread and there was incense and there was the candlestick and there were all of these things. And all of them have things that pertain to us in the New Testament. Matter of fact, when the Lord told Moses how to design the tabernacle, he said, see that you make it according to the pattern that you saw in the mount. Moses literally saw into heaven and in heaven there is a temple. And Moses saw the temple and he designed the tabernacle and then later Solomon's temple was designed after the temple that does exist in heaven. And right here in Hebrews it says that Jesus went and applied his blood on the altar in heaven. There is actually a temple in heaven. And Jesus, the, he revealed to Moses all of these things and so everything was designed after something that is a reality in heaven. And it lists all of this, but look at this. When you get down to talking about the uh, Holy of Holies and the Ark of the Covenant that was in there in verse four, it says, well, let me back up in verse three. It says, and after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded and the tables of the covenant. So it's describing the Ark of the Covenant, what was in there and these uh, things that were in the Holy of Holies. 
And then in verse five, it says, and over it, the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. People just pass over this and think, what does that mean? It says that you can't talk about the cherubs in the new covenant because the cherubs were there to protect and keep anyone from coming into God's presence. In Isaiah chapter 59, God's hand isn't short that it cannot say, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated between you and God. And so in the Old Testament, there was a separation between God and man. And these cherubs over the mercy seat were there that if anybody entered the Holy of Holies except the high priest once a year, having done everything perfectly, the cherubs would strike him dead. But now we can't speak about the cherubs because the veil is rent. No cherub is going to stand between you and God and you have access to come boldly into the very presence of God. And yet our conscience condemns us and makes us feel unworthy. And most Christians aren't taking advantage of that. You know, we're going to go ahead and pass out our offering envelopes if our ushers would do that. I'm going to take an offering here. Uh, but let me just say this in uh, Hebrews chapter 9. It says in verse uh, 12, Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. There's not very many Christians that believe they've been forgiven of all sin once. They believe they were forgiven up until the time they get born again. And then after they're born again, every time they sin, that's a new affront against God. And they got to get that confessed and under the blood. This says you, you were having obtained eternal redemption for us by one offering. And then in verse 13, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Did you know if you don't understand this and if you are still letting your conscience, your conscience is neither moral nor immoral. It's just something that tells you right from wrong. And it'll never say, well, yes, you did wrong, but God loves you anyway and praise God for Jesus. No, it'll just tell you that you're wrong. And did you know your conscience will never compliment you on all the good things you do. It'll just convict you over all the wrong things you do. You do 99 things right, one thing wrong, your conscience will smite you and say you're unworthy. And you've got to have your conscience purged from dead works before you can serve a living God. And this is why so many people cannot truly serve God because their own conscience is condemning them. There's a lot of people that have been called into ministry and yet their own conscience convicts them and they feel unworthy and because of it, they aren't sure that God is going to be with them. Did you know God used the donkey one time? Not because the donkey was holy and had been fasting and praying or anything. God, if he can talk through a donkey, he can talk through any of us. And we need to just become bold because of what Jesus has done, enter boldly into the very holy of holies and stand there and speak as the oracles of God. The oracles of God means you are speaking from the Ark of the Covenant. You are the very voice of God and you have, need to have that boldness and you can't do that if your conscience is condemning you. Man, those are awesome, awesome statements. And most people don't realize they'll blame the devil and I'm, I'm all for blaming the devil for everything we can blame the devil for. I have no affinity for the devil. I'm, I'm just out to slander him every way I can. But there's some things that, that I believe the devil is even surprised that you do. I believe sometimes he looks at that and thinks, man, that was good. And he's going to take notes on how you have defeated yourself, your own conscience it's not all the devil. It's your own conscience and you have to have your conscience purged from dead works by the blood of Jesus. That's talking about what Jesus did for us. You approach God on the basis of Jesus and what he's done and not on the basis of what you've done. If you come before God and if you don't have boldness in your relation, if you come in bowing and scraping and apologizing and talking how ungodly you are, 
then you haven't really appropriated everything that the blood of Jesus has made for you. Amen? Yeah. That's amazing. You know, here in our campus, I don't know what they're doing at KCBC, but at our campus, you can go ahead and receive the offering, but I'm going to keep talking for another four minutes and 55 seconds. <laughs> and let me just say that, you know, when the Lord first started showing me this, I was raised in a denomination that taught salvation, but then they taught that you basically limp through life. You're an old sinner saved by grace. But man, I've come to realize I was an old sinner and I got saved by grace and now I don't live with a sin consciousness. And one of the things that really spoke to me, I had been studying this. I saw it with my understanding, but it was so foreign to the way that I was taught that I still struggled. And I was dealing with condemnation and thinking, God, how could I come boldly before you? I know I'm forgiven. If I die, I won't go to hell. But I, how do I have boldness in my relationship? And so I was thinking about this and I walked outside. This is before I got married. And I had uh, gotten a dog for my mother while I was in Vietnam to protect her. And it was three-fourths German Shepherd and one-fourth Chow. And it was this big dog and it was mean looking, but it, it had been beat with a trace chain before I got it. And every time this dog, I call this dog honey because that's what it looked like. It was the color of honey. Its coat was, that's what Abraham Lincoln named his dog, I found out. But anyway, I, I called this dog honey and I walked out and sat down on the back porch and here comes my dog bounding across the yard. And when it gets about five feet away, it stops and rolls over on its side and goes to whimpering and scoots up to me, wondering if I'm going to hit it. And I'd had this dog for years and it still did that every single time. And so I just lost it. <laughs> and I said, you know, it's hard to get mad at your dog when its name is Honey. And I said, I said, honey, and I said, what's wrong with you? I said, you act like I beat you. I said, I've never done that to you. I said, people see this and they get a wrong impression of me. I said, just one time, I'd like you to be like a normal dog and just run up and jump on me and, and treat me like I like you instead of like I beat you. And I was just reading this dog, the riot act. And God spoke to me and he said, Andrew, that's exactly the way I feel about you. He says, I died, I forgave your sins. And yet every time you come in, you go to talking about how unworthy you are and you feel like you have to mention your sins quickly. And if you'll mention them, maybe I won't. And you come in with this sin consciousness. And boy, that illustration has stuck with me my whole life. That many of us are just because the devil beat us up and because we have done things wrong, we come before God bowing and scraping, crawling in on our hands and knees. Oh God, we're so unworthy. Well, it's true that we are unworthy in just our own actions, but we are supposed to be worshiping God in spirit and in truth. And in your spirit, you're a brand new person. And if you are worshiping him in spirit, then there is nothing for you to be condemned about. There is nothing for you to feel bad about. It says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 30, that Jesus has made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Now, all of your righteousness is like filthy rags, Isaiah 64, 6. That's talking about your self-righteousness. In yourself, you don't have the right to demand things of God. But if you are born again, you got a brand new spirit and Jesus has become your righteousness. So if you come in before God, bowed and scrape it and, oh God, I'm so unworthy, you aren't worshiping him in spirit. You're operating in your flesh. You're worshiping him in your natural self. And that will not work. You must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. So brothers and sisters, the problem is Jesus has purchased us a brand new way unto the Father through the veil. There is no more any separation. The cherubs are gone. Nobody's going to do anything. If an angel tried to stand in between you and God, you could rebuke him in the name of Jesus because you have total access to the Father. There is no resistance on God's part. It's our own conscience. It's condemning us and you have to learn how to purge your conscience from dead works before you can serve the living God. Man, that's really awesome. So that little book that I've got is a study on the conscience and it would really be a blessing to you. Again, let me say thanks to KCBC and all of you there, Dr. Ebby and everyone. Thank you so much 
uh, for being a part of this. Man, we love you and we are glad to be a part of the body of Christ. And God bless all of you there at KCBC. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Amen. You're dismissed.